Good morning, this is Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. I'm Tom McKenzie in London. These are the stories that set your agenda. NVIDIA leads the magnificent seven higher, driving the S&P 500 and NASDAQ to fresh records. The chipmaker roars past $3 trillion in value, leapfrogging Apple. Diverging from the Fed, the ECB poised to start cutting interest rates from record highs today. But the path beyond looks murkier. Plus, the Netherlands kicks off voting in the European Parliament elections later today. We discuss what's at stake as 27 nations decide. Let's check in on these markets then. The 25th record high for the S&P so far this year. Yes, NVIDIA was part of that catalyst, driving the market to that new record. And European futures looking uh, to build on the upside as well. Yes, US futures pointing to very modest gains, given the upside that we saw yesterday. European futures with the catch-up play coming in. Markets now almost fully pricing in two cuts from the Federal Reserve. Yields fell again yesterday on the 10-year, down around basis points. ADP the print around the private jobs and the payrolls there softening more than expected and just building out that picture of a cooling jobs market in the US. European futures looking to add four tenths of percent. Here in the UK, the FTSE 100 is pointing higher by around 20 points. Commodities getting a lift so far in the session. The S&P is flat. Nasdaq futures pointed to modest gains of a tenth of a percent after the rally that we saw yesterday. Let's flip the board and have a quick look then at the 10-year benchmark given the yield move yesterday of around four basis points. We are, of course, continuing to assess the economic data out of the U.S. and lead up to the importance of the non-farm payroll print, of course, on Friday to build out that picture. 4.29 on the 10-year yield move of just around two basis points after the fall of four basis points yesterday. The bond rally, it seems, continues. Euro dollar at 108, and of course, on a significant historic day for the ECB, cutting for the first time, expected, of course, expected for the first time uh, before the Fed ever on record. We'll see if that comes to pass. 108 on euro dollar, 78 dollars a barrel on Brent, on Brent, up five tenths of a percent, and Bitcoin, 71,000, down two tenths of a percent, but it has rallied on the back of expectations around Fed cuts. 71,000 on the largest cryptocurrency. Let's cross over to Asia. Avril Hong standing by in Singapore with a check on markets there. Avril. Yeah, those expectations of Fed cuts really lifting the mood in the Asia-Pacific. But particularly for tech shares, it was how NVIDIA crossed that $3 trillion market cap mark. It's helping to reinvigorate what we're seeing on the sector. In this part of the world, the TIEX is outperforming. We're even seeing the CSI 300 in the green today. Despite some lingering concerns about the property sector, we have a gauge of property developer stocks listed in Hong Kong actually sliding 20% from their May highs. And this is really reinforcing the idea that after the rescue package that we saw, there are not many boosts that we're seeing to the real estate sector. Concerns very real on that part of the industry. Let's flip the board and take a look at what we're seeing in the tech names because TSMC is rallying to a record high today. It's gotten upgraded on its price target by Morgan Stanley, which expects it to raise fees because NVIDIA recently acknowledged the value of its foundry services and we also announced a share buyback today. Uh, so we're seeing a really buoyant mood coming through on this chip stock. Let's flip the board because we've also been keeping a close watch on what's happening in India, of course. Uh, after that initial shock from the election results, the dust seems to be settling a little bit. The Sensex is extending that rebound, which we already saw yesterday, but not quite helping the rupee, which is weakening still, even on a day where we're seeing a softer US dollar as those expectations about Fed rate cuts seem to accelerate. It's helping the Indonesian rupiah, which yesterday plunged to a four-year low against the greenback on the yen. One thing I wanted to highlight, that even though we're seeing these gains today, it is pairing them after a BOJ board member, a known dove, said policy settings seem to be appropriate. And, you know, it seems like that is causing investors to kind of adjust their expectations of what we get out of the BOJ next week, Tom. Yeah, the BOJ decision on Friday of next week. Avril Hong in Singapore with a check on the Asian markets. Thank you very much indeed. And staying on the central bank story, the ECB expected, of course, to kick off its rate-cutting cycle today before the Federal Reserve for the first time ever. Despite a bumpier retreat in price growth, President Christine Lagarde declared in May 
then inflation is, quote, under control. Let's cross over to Bloomberg's Lizzie Burden, then, who is standing outside the ECB on a foggy day in Frankfurt. Lizzie, we are expecting, of course, the decision, the cut. That is pretty much fully priced by these markets. Not guaranteed, but it seems to be consensus at this point. But also the forecasts around growth and inflation. What are you looking for? You're absolutely right, Tom. And yeah, no one told them in Frankfurt that the weather's changed. It's time to change direction and cut rates. The ECB cut today, well telegraphed, fully priced by markets and almost unanimously expected by economists. Even some of the more hawkish members of the governing council, the likes of Isabel Schnabel and Joachim Nagel, accepting that it's time to cut today. But that level of commitment has raised some eyebrows in recent days because of the latest economic data inflation sticky, wage growth rapid and therefore the focus today very much on the path beyond June. How many cuts do we get this year? You mentioned the forecasts. If you see an upward revision to inflation in 2026, that would suggest that the bar is high for cuts. We'll also, of course, be listening to the press conference with Christine Lagarde for clues on the cadence of cuts here on out. Do they come quarterly or do we get a pause and a return to data dependence? You're going to have to have some strong signals from Christine Lagarde today, perhaps, to get sustainable weakness in euro dollar, Tom. Yeah, and you talk about the stickiness of inflation and you rightly highlight the wage growth as well, which raises the question as the ECB looks to break the mould and go ahead of the Fed for the first time ever as to whether or not the situation really is that different between the eurozone on the inflation front and the US. Yeah, of course, the starting points were very different. For the US, it was that massive fiscal boost. For the euro area, it was the energy crisis following the invasion of Ukraine. But at this point, parallels are being drawn because you've got sticky inflation on both sides of the pond and policy easing now could be cast as policy errors later. So you've had warnings off the back of that economic data from the likes of Schnabel and Nagel ruling out essentially a July cut. Holtzman saying that he only sees two cuts for the rest of 2024. It could be, Tom, that we see less divergence between the Federal Reserve and the ECB than when it lo- what it looked like when I was last stood here in April. OK, Lizzie Burden, thank you very much indeed. Outside, of course, the ECB's headquarters in Frankfurt. And, of course, Lizzie will be across that story for us uh, throughout the day. And a reminder, we will have full coverage of that ECB policy decision at 1.15 p.m. UK time. We will also bring you, of course, President Christine Lagarde's news conference. That is a half an hour after the decision. Now to the politics of the Eurozone. The Netherlands is the first country to kick off four days of voting in the European Parliament elections later today. More than 370 million people across 27 EU nations are eligible to vote. Let's get more with Bloomberg's Oliver Crook. Ollie, what is the timeline then for voting among EU nations? Yeah, Tom, your excitement is palpable. So it really kicks off in 21 minutes in the Netherlands with the first vote being cast in the European election in the Netherlands. They're going to elect the 31 MEPs that they get out of the 720. And as you say, that is extended across four days. So what happens next? You know, we have Ireland tomorrow. Then on Saturday, you get the sort of big first uh, nation of Italy. And then Sunday is when you really get most of the action with Germany, Spain, and many of the other European countries. And by Monday, you get a picture of what it looks like in terms of the parties that have actually been elected to this European Parliament. What happens next is where do these parties actually sit? In what broader parliamentary group will they actually participate in? This has gotten interesting, Tom, in the last couple of weeks because the AFD got, for example, booted from the Identity and Democracy Party. Where will they sit? And then that will ask the question of then what groups can work with one another? Then it gets kicked to the leaders who then have to sort of have these really backroom discussions about who they want to put forward as the president of the commission. There's also need they need to weigh who's going to run each of the commissions by country by party. It all gets very complicated. But once the leaders have chosen somebody, very likely right now, Ursula von der Leyen, that then goes to another sort of interesting little part, which is the secret ballot in Parliament, where that person needs to get a majority of votes, 361 votes. This gets interesting, Tom, because again, it's a secret ballot. You can vote wherever you want. And what's interesting is Ursula von der Leyen only won by nine votes in that last time. So really, when we think about the timeline, kicks off today. And if everything goes to plan without any snags, we'll have an idea of the arc architecture of the European Parliament and its sort of institutions for the next five years by sort of mid-July.
There you go. Secrecy, complexity, political horse trading. You, <laughs> as ever, have injected the excitement into this election. Oli, you're sitting there in Berlin. When you think about Germany and the vote there, the implications for the nation that sits at the heart of Europe in terms of the economic clout of Germany, what are you watching for? So what's really interesting, Tom, is that the sort of European elections are this kind of weird and interesting canvas for a lot of different kinds of political expression, right? So you have, on the one hand, people that are maybe voting for the actual EU policies. They're like, you know, we want these policies, we want these politicians, and we're going to vote for this party. For many others, Tom, it's going to be a sort of referendum on national politics, how they feel about what's going on in their country. Others might be doing sort of counter-programming, saying, hey, listen, I would never elect this party within my own country, but actually in the EU parliament, it makes kind of sense. And, of course, we'll be watching turnout, right? Last time you had about 60% turnout, which was a little bit higher than I, or sorry, 50% turnout, a little higher than I'd anticipated. It's lower than the national level, but still that's half of the people in Europe voting for this. In Germany, where it gets sort of interesting is, you know, you get that, you get that referendum on Schultz and his coalition. There's been a lot of backlash potentially on the Greens and some of the green policy. Does that materialize um, politically? But, of course, Tom, something we've been talking about a lot in the lead up to the EU elections and a lot in Germany is this absolute rise and this wave of of the sort of extreme far right, a wave that has sort of crashed in the last couple of weeks, Tom, after there have been a lot of different scandals um, within the AFD. There have also been a number of sort of violent political attacks within Germany, including yesterday, Tom, where an AFD local politician was actually stabbed. It's not clear that that was politically motivated, but it comes after there have been a lot of these things. So all of this sort of heightened tension, and will we see actually this going a little bit closer to the center, the traditional center of the CDU, all that to watch for? OK, Oliver Crook, a great breakdown of the vote, of course. Starts in the Netherlands today, but also looking at the implications for Germany. Oli Crook, thank you very much indeed. Back to the markets now. The S&P 500 notching up its 25th record close this year, yesterday, with AI poster child NVIDIA leading the way after hitting $3 trillion in market value. NVIDIA has now surpassed Apple as the second most valuable company in the world. For more, let's bring in Bloomberg's MLive strategist, Mary Nicola. Mary, give us the view then in terms of the, the catalyst that drove this fresh record, the S&P, a fresh record, the 25th record for 2024. What was behind this and, and is there any sense as to whether or not this is sustainable? You know, there's two key things here that probably drove the rally. And one of them is the fact that fundamentals still remain strong. So if we look, let's say, at NVIDIA, uh, it's, it's, it's surpassing its rivals. It's going, it's looking to improve every year and looking on, in terms of and setting itself apart. Meanwhile, demand for AI and for chips remains really strong because you still have that strong AI drive going through. So that's one clear factor that's coming through is the fundamental side. Then you have the tailwinds that you're seeing from U.S. From U.S. yields, so we've had a decline in U.S. yields over the past few days. That's obviously given, especially growth stocks like uh, Nvidia and other tech, a, a nice little boost. So if you have that combination, that combination is likely to accelerate. What we could see is if we see uh, a non-farm payroll coming through and showing that you know prices are a bit sticky and the and uh, employment is cooling. That obviously can thwart some of the rally that we've been seeing and have an impact on even the likes of NVIDIA. But for NVIDIA as a whole, that AI story, that AI drive, that demand for chips is going to keep that, keep it supported. OK, three trillion dollar market cap. Uh, and Jensen Huang of NVIDIA adding five billion to his own personal wealth just in a single day. Bloomberg's MLive strategist Mary Nicola on some of the drivers for this fresh record high and, of course, the importance of NVIDIA still. Mary, thank you very much indeed. Coming up, Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi wins crucial backing from two key allies in his coalition, allowing him to form a government. We look at how markets in India are reacting to that news. Plus, we go live to the Super Return Private Equity Conference in Berlin for two exclusive interviews, 6.30 London time. We are joined by Michael Brun, Global Co-Head of Private Equity at Goldman Sachs Asset Management. And at 6.40, we will be speaking to Rachel Arnold, Senior Managing Director at Vista Equity Partners. Catch those conversations later this hour. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg.
Welcome back to Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. Happy Thursday. Now, South African assets were among the world's worst performers yesterday. That's after the African National Congress, the ANC, said it's considering a government comprising several parties rather than a tie-up with a business-friendly democratic alliance. The ANC has started engagements with political parties in the country. We have been meeting with all parties that are keen to contribute ideas on how we can collectively move our country forward to form a government that ensures national unity. Let's get more on this story then and bring in Bloomberg's Jennifer Dabasaja, who joins us live from Johannesburg. Jen, how likely is this, is this proposed government of, of national unity, as it's being framed, how likely is it to take shape ultimately? Right, Tom. Uh, you know, this was quite a development that we got uh, yesterday. And it was interesting to hear from the ANC that they are engaging with all parties, uh, except that uh, of the MK party, they said they have not received a response. But listen, this was uh, the smaller portion of the ANC, the National Working Committee, uh, that said that they are, you know, having these discussions. Now it's really up uh, to the bigger, uh, the top brass, as we call it, of the ANC to make a decision. Uh, and these negotiations are starting uh, today behind behind closed doors. And really the reason why we heard from the ANC about this is that they say, you know, this is what the South African people uh, voted for, especially if you take a look at those percentages of support. Uh, they say this is the most inclusive option. And it wouldn't be the first time for this country. It was also a government of national unity back in 1994 uh, during uh, Nelson Mandela's time. Uh, but the question, though, really is can these parties that are very disparate in terms of their ideology come together uh, and Will that really, uh, you know, form some sort of government that can actually get things done? Uh, and that is perhaps why we saw the reaction from the markets on Wednesday. Yeah, well, talk us a, a little bit more around the market reaction to this. What, what, what are the concerns around market participants? What are the, the kind of the, the risk scenarios and, and the upside scenarios that market uh, uh, participants, investors may, may be thinking about when it comes to this? Right. Well, you know, the biggest question is, will these parties be able to actually work together? And you were mentioning the Democratic Alliance, Tom. Uh, we've heard we had uh, the Democratic Alliance here earlier this week. They said that they will not uh, work in a coalition uh, with some of the leftist parties like the EFF uh, and also the MK party. We also heard uh, from South Africa's Communist Party saying that they will not work uh, with the Democratic Alliance. So there's still uh, clearly uh, are a lot of uh, roadblocks here in terms of getting all of these different parties on the same page. Uh, and perhaps that is why we saw some of the reaction uh, in the markets. And, and so although the ANC is describing this as inclusive, the, the, the question really is, will they be able to get on the same page and get some broader policy decisions uh, decided on? Uh, no one, that's anyone's guess. And it seems like the market is not convinced that that will happen uh, and potentially that they will have to give in to some of those uh, more radical policies that the market was hoping not for. But the interesting thing, Tom, uh, we did hear from one of the largest asset managers here in South Africa, that is 91, uh, the CEO saying that potentially a government of national unity could be beneficial uh, for the economy. So we'll wait to see whether or not other business leaders uh, get on board with this. But the market's not, not quite convinced yet. OK, the uncertainty is still there for market participants and indeed the people of yeah. South Africa as they wait for more details. Bloomberg's Jennifer Zapasaja on the ground for us in Johannesburg. Thank you. So from the politics of South Africa to the politics of India and arguably a little bit more clarity when it comes to India because the Prime Minister Narendra Modi has won crucial backing from two key allies in his coalition, allowing him to form a government and extend his decade in power. Let's get more then in terms of the details and bring in Bloomberg's senior reporter on Asia equities, Abhishek Vishnoi. Abhishek, what does then, this is still a weakened Modi, but he's managed to cobble together, it seems, this coalition. What does it mean then ultimately for, for Indian equities that, of course, have been, wow, whipsawed in the last few days? Well, you know, this is uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi's first tryst with coalition politics. You know, so coalition partners are going to have some say at least, which means that, you know, you have to look this in context of time periods, short term, medium term, long term. In mm -hmm. the short term, like how market is given the verdict right now, valuation premium, which is at record versus a lot of peers, would come down because there is some policy uncertainty seeping in, especially, you know, uh, for reforms related to factors of production like land and labor, right? Uh, 
Now that's for the short term. Now for the medium term, because coalition partners are there and uh, you know the backing from key allies have largely come from leaders who have in past handled portfolios like tech or IT companies uh, or railway, right? So these sectors are in focus as to what would happen for them. Uh, this means over the medium term, mm. valuations might trickle down a little lower, but uh, you know, there won't be as big of an impact. There might be swings. So higher equity risk premium, lower risk adjusted returns. That's medium term. For the long run, economic upcycle remains on track. Earnings remains on track. Story is very much bullish for the long run. OK, Abhishek, thank you very much indeed on the long term, medium term uh, and short term risks around the equity markets of India that are uh, picking up today, seeing gains on the Sensex of a little over 1% and making up for much of the losses that have come through, of course, immediately after some of those vote counts came through earlier this week. Abhishek, thank you very much indeed on the latest out of the Indian political story and, of course, the implications for the equity markets of that country. There is plenty more coming up. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. Now to some of the other stories making the news this Thursday. The Bank of Canada has become the first G7 central bank to kick off an easing cycle. Policymakers, led by Governor Tiff Macklem, lowered the benchmark rate by 25 basis points to 4.75% yesterday as widely expected by economists. Macklem said it is reasonable to expect more cuts if price pressures continue to cool. He also pushed back on questions about the Bank of Canada veering from the Fed. The U.S. Justice Department and the Federal Trade Commission have reportedly given the green light to antitrust investigations into NVIDIA, Microsoft and OpenAI, all major players, of course, in the AI space. Meanwhile, the Wall Street Journal is reporting that the FTC is looking into Microsoft's deal with AI startup Inflection. The companies involved are expected to fight the investigations. And ASML has become Europe's second most valuable listed company, overtaking LVMH for the first time ever. The shares jumped 8% yesterday, valuing the firm that produces equipment for making the world's most sophisticated semiconductors at about 377 billion euros. Drug maker Nova Nordisk remains the region's most valuable company. And the family behind Chanel is and has pocketed $12.4 billion in payouts from the luxury brand's earnings just over the past three years. The Cayman Islands-based holding company behind Chanel is to receive a $5.7 billion dividend for 2023. That is the largest since it began publishing results in London six years ago. London Metric Property will join the FTSE 100 in a reshuffle that pushes Ocado out of Britain's blue chip index for the first time in six years. With a market cap of £4.2 billion, UK landlord London Metric joins cybersecurity firm Darktrace and home builder Vistry Group in being promoted to the benchmark. Online gross Ocado drops down into the FTSE 250 mid-cap index along with wealth manager St James's Place. Coming up, we return to the world's largest private equity event. We will be speaking to the global co-head of private equity at Goldman Sachs Asset Management, live from Superturn, Berlin. That is next. This is Bloomberg. Good morning. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. I'm Tom McKenzie in London. These are the stories that set your agenda. NVIDIA leads the Magnificent 7 higher, driving the S&P 500 and the Nasdaq to fresh records. The chipmaker roars past $3 trillion in value, leapfrogging Apple. Diverging from the Fed, the ECB is poised to start cutting interest rates from record highs today. But the path beyond looks murkier. Plus, the Netherlands kicks off voting in the European Parliament elections later today. We discuss what is at stake 
as 27 nations decide. Let's check in on these markets. And yes, fresh records for the S&P yesterday, driven partly by the story around NVIDIA. The 25th record high for the S&P, at least in 2024. Does it have further legs from here? We check in on the earnings story of Remy Cointreau, the French cognac maker, of course, in terms of the full year current operating income coming in above the estimates. 304 million euros above the estimates of 296. That's on full year current operating income. In terms of the full year organic current operating profit, full year operating profit, that was a drop of 27, almost 28 percent. They are coming through with a full year dividend per share above the estimates, two euros. The estimates had been just shy of that. The stock down around 27 percent year to date. Let's get back to the markets more broadly then. The impulse coming through from NVIDIA, of course, a very strong rally for Europe yesterday. ASML, a big factor in that with the gains of 8%. We check in on the futures right now. European futures looking to build on the upside of yesterday, looking to add four tenths of a percent. FTSE 100 futures with a commodities rally in the session, at least today, up two tenths of a percent. S&P futures flat after that record of yesterday. And Nasdaq futures looking to add a tenth of a percent. Let's flip the board and look cross asset then. Yields dropped four basis points yesterday. Today, ADP private jobs data softening again, pointing to a bit of cooling around the labour market of the US. The benchmark tenure at 4.29 euro dollar on a massive day, of course, for the currency in the ECB. 108 up a tenth of a percent. Brent at 78 dollars a barrel, gaining four tenths of a percent. And Bitcoin back below 71,000 at 70,870. Let's go to the European Central Bank then. The ECB poised to start lowering interest rates from record highs today, confident that inflation is sufficiently contained to ease the burden on that economy. Let's go to Bloomberg's Lizzie Burden, who remains on the ground for us in Frankfurt, watching all of this for us. What are we expecting then, Lizzie? Well, Tom, Christine Lagarde is in the building. She's arrived and she's been telegraphing this decision for a long time. We're expecting a rate cut today to 3.75%. It's fully priced by markets. It's almost unanimously expected by economists. But as you say, the recent economic data have muddied the waters for the path ahead. Yeah. Inflation's been sticky. Wage growth has been rapid. And therefore, we look to the clues to the path ahead because economists have said they expect three cuts this year, but traders have paired their bets. They are only fully pricing two. We'll look to the forecasts for inflation for clues. Do they revise upwards for 2026? That would signal a high bar for more cuts. We'll also be listening closely to Madame Lagarde. Does she say uh, that we're going to have quarterly cuts from here on out? Or is it a cut today, a pause and a return to data dependence? OK, Bloomberg's Lizzie Burton outside the ECB in Frankfurt, covering the story, of course, uh, throughout the day. Lizzie, thank you very much indeed. Now, the world's largest private equity and venture capital event is taking place in Berlin. And, of course, central banks and monetary policy will be kind of the conversations there. Bloomberg Markets today and Kriti Gupta on the ground for us in Berlin at Super Return. Kriti. Tom, thank you so much. One of the big conversations, of course, in the private capital markets and the equity markets, the credit markets, is going to be what that translation of this higher for longer narrative looks like. And then, of course, the policy divergence that Lizzie was just talking about on both sides of the Atlantic. Lucky for us, I have the perfect guest to talk about it and expand on how that translates into the P.E. world. Joining me now for an exclusive conversation is Michael Brunn, global co-head of private equity over at Goldman Sachs Alternatives. A pleasure to have you on the program. We thank you so much. Connect the dots for us here as we talk about higher for longer, longer than expected, by the way. We just heard Lizzie there talking about the fact that rates are now getting pushed back, uh, rate cuts, excuse me, are getting pushed back further and further. What does that mean for the private capital markets that aren't as reactive as, say, the public ones are? First of all, thank you for having me this morning. Um, we're certainly seeing a slow recovery in private markets as rate adjusts, uh, rates adjust, and that slow recovery is fueled by two things. On one hand, we're seeing a recovery because of financing conditions becoming better. Um, I would say that, yes, rate cuts have been slower than we probably originally anticipated, but the direction of travel seen from our perspective is pretty clear, and we think that financing costs will come down over time, maybe already a bit of base rate reduction today. And so uh, that's definitely helping build activity. And then on the other hand, we're seeing that the 
uh, need to, for existing private equity-owned assets to transact is becoming more time-bound. Uh, there's a large community of LPs who need what we call DPI, i.e. a return of capital, and those two factors in combination are driving a slow uh, but steady recovery in, uh, in deal activity. Well, that seems to be the consensus here, that people are more optimistic about private capital at a time when, I would argue, in other spheres of the market, they're more concerned about when the party actually stops. What does that mean for valuations, though? If if you're seeing green on the screen in your equity market, green on the screen in the private capital market, does that just mean things are overvalued? Where do you stand on that? No, actually what we're seeing in private markets is that uh, valuations have actually come down a little bit over the last 12 months. And I think that's because of this uh, slight imbalance between how, how much capital had been, been deployed in prior, prior vintages and then the need for that, that uh, capital to again be returned. And so what we're seeing is that the gap between buyer and seller has narrowed over the last 12 months and that's very supportive for uh, more deal activity. Um, when you then introduce the fact that base rates are probably coming down and the credit spreads, uh, very much thanks to the reopening of the syndicated loan market, are narrowing, those two factors then really helps uh, generate a bit more deal activity. Well, that mismatch between buyers and sellers is leading to a real lack of buyout exits. And you've seen hedge funds, for example, actually very, very vocal about it. The idea that some of the institutions, the endowments that are funding some of these PE deals, well, their money's all wrapped up, that they can't deploy it in other ways. And of course, ultimately hurting some of the smart money active, more active in the public markets. When do you see that, you talked about that narrowing spread between buyers and sellers. Give us a timeline here. When might that narrow even more to the point that exits become more popular. No, I think I think there's so I think we're seeing steady progress. Um, I think one of the things that is helping is that we're also starting to see the f- first IPOs. And one of the things we know is that when base rates are coming down, usually that's very helpful for IPO markets. Whether that's three, nine, or 15 months away, I think it's still hard to tell. But we do see that the IPO market is getting into gear slowly. And so the fact that the IPO market is being more conducive, the fact that credit markets are more conducive, all of that should lead uh, to more. A deal activity. But I will say that it, first and foremost, I think it's also worth reflecting at this moment in time on what does a good deal look like. And so I think a lot of people are revisiting the playbook, focusing much more today on value creation through operational excellence, through activating your network, making sure that you align yourself with secular growth trends, making sure that the businesses that you buy fit into a strategic context, because there's there's an assumption sometimes in the market that you can just sell the asset on to the next financial buyer or sell it to an IPO. In this case, we will interact with the hedge funds in that connection. But wouldn't it be better if we sold a lot of our assets to strategic buyers with synergies, and those buyers seem to have been less affected if you look at corporate M&A, i.e. away from uh, private equity activity, you will actually see that there's still a very healthy corporate M&A market. So for those who have been creating companies that fit into that corporate context, you're actually seeing pretty healthy uh, exits also at this moment in time. It's interesting that you use the word healthy because I'm going to throw a curveball at you. Brace yourself, if you will. Jamie Dimon over at JP Morgan made a comment recently that took a lot of the private capital markets by surprise, saying that private credit may have some similarities to the mortgage market in the GFC obviously traumatizing, I think, everyone in the financial space. He's making the point, though, that even though this is a thriving market, ultimately some of the deals may be too complex. Some of the deals may be not worth the ratings that they're being getting by the credit agencies. I want to bring that back to the story of where the warning signs in this market may actually be, especially as some of these deal structures get more complicated. First of all, I think that when you construct a private equity deal, you shouldn't rely overly too much on uh, private credit. I I think it's important that the vast majority of your value creation comes from operational initiatives and by scaling the company through operations, growth, maybe growth in new geographies, maybe you go into breaks into new sectors, et cetera. And you should not rely on just, you know, trying to create like an economic equation that on paper works just because you have access to cheap debt. I think some deal construction has been made that looks like that, and that's probably less healthy for long-term value creation. I do not think at this moment in time that we have a systemic problem. We are not seeing that. Um, We are seeing, however, that there are obviously new entrants coming into the private credit market, and they need to try and figure out what are the good assets and not just so like take the marginal assets, the the, the less well-performing assets. Do you feel that there's a trend, especially under middle market activity, to do those bigger deals, to do the juicier deals, especially with some of these new entrants? 
I, I think that um, where we in our platform play, which is what we call upper mid-market, we have seen an ability to really drive value creation through operations and through the power of the network that we activate. And we will therefore continue to say that it, it, it's very tempting to con consistently try and go up in size to, you know, hoard even more AUM uh, in or, and by doing even bigger deals. I think that we need to look over long periods of time and look at what are the returns that have been generated. And we certainly see that in the upper mid market, very, very healthy returns can, can be generated by really helping these companies scale. It's fascinating when you look at the amount of resources, we call it a resource race that we deploy into an upper mid-market investment, the world-class talent that we can source onto our platform and then yeah. inject into the portfolio companies, we see great, great results. And so that's why we think that that's a good place for us to play. I love that you called it a resource race because there's also a question right now, and again, the post-GFC world, where we're talking about what role the banks actually play in the private markets, whereas maybe private capital, private equity, private credit, filling a void of financing that a lot of the major banks, like yourself, like Goldman, took a step back. What does that partnership look like? Are you partnering with some of the bigger PE firms? Are you looking to do these deals on your own? What does that look like? Oh, I mean, we're open-minded. We, we, are, we are often the controlling shareholder in what we do, but we are open-minded to sometimes be co-controlling shareholder. I'm sure multiple uh, platforms come with multiple benefits. I would say in terms of the banks versus the private credit markets, we are seeing a reopening of the syndicated loan market, and that's obviously led by the banks. And so we, we think it's very healthy for markets that we're not just relying on private credit, but we can have a balance between syndicated loan markets and private credit. And what we've seen over the last six months is that that has overall driven the cost of capital down, and that's been very helpful, especially when you're doing deals where you are relying on some leverage in the beginning, but on, on also ongoing access to leverage, because one of the best ways in this era, in, my, in, in our mind, to build value is to buy a platform and then do bold-on acquisitions, often at very accretive multiples, and some of those bold-on acquisitions you would do by injecting more equity, and some of it you will do by taking more leverage, and it's so therefore healthy for those deals to have a very, very functional uh, debt market, both in the syndicate loan market and in the private credit market. And of course, in, your, in Europe, we're also seeing the leveraged loan market open up, which is going to create an additional dynamic to that. We thank you so much. Michael Brunn, Global Co-Head of Private Equity over at Goldman Sachs Alternatives. Tom, back to you. Bloomberg Markets today, anchor Kriti Gupta on the ground for us in Berlin, of course, with that exclusive interview from Super Return. Kriti, thank you. Coming up, we're going to head back to Berlin, where Kriti is going to be speaking with the Senior Managing Director at Vista Equity Partners. It's a firm with $100 billion of assets under management. That exclusive interview is next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back. It is the world's largest private equity event and it is in full swing in Berlin. Bloomberg Markets today anchor Kriti Gupta is on the ground for us at Super Return with another fantastic guest. Kriti. Tom, thank you. One of the big conversations in the market right now, you're no stranger to this, is what's going on, of course, in the big tech space. We talk about this all the time in the public markets. NVIDIA, Salesforce, when the party keeps going, what makes it crack? And they're starting to see some of those concerns again in the public market. Does it then drag down the rest of the market? Now, that's the public story. Those are the big heavy hitters. It does have a translation into how investors around the world, even in the private markets, are looking at some of that software enterprise story, looking at that AI story, and changing not only the valuation of it, but even the funding story of it. We have the perfect guest to talk more about that. Joining me for now for an exclusive interview, Rachel Arnold, Senior Managing Director over at Vista Equity Partners, about $102 billion of assets under management. Rachel, a pleasure to have you and see you in Berlin. It's lovely to have you. Walk us through that story, that translation between some of the worries we're seeing in the public markets, that reaction that we're seeing on the upside and the downside. How does that show up in private financing for software? You know, what I think is really interesting and important to keep in mind is that with over 100,000 enterprise software companies globally, 97% of them are private. And so while what I think we're seeing in the public market is still an assessment of the long-term impact of generative AI, which is still candidly being digested and determined, private markets just aren't quite as 
as concerned about that issue. You know, I think as we're early innings with generative AI, we're really seeing an incredible amount of opportunity on the horizon, and the resiliency of the enterprise software business model means that we remain really bullish about the future. How bullish, though? And is bullish too bullish? And this is a question I ask, again, in the context of when you see so much green on the screen, when everyone wants to get in on the trade, there still seems to be some haziness and and lack of clarity around when that return actually comes. How bullish is too bullish? When do you think, or what signs are you looking for that perhaps the valuations are looking a little too toppy? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, what I think is really important to keep in mind is that some of these trends are going to take years to play out. We're looking at how some of the operating model shifts from generative AI, the technology application, but also the end thesis for what these products can do for every sector globally will take, in some cases, 3, 5, 10, 15 years to actually come to fruition. And so for us, it's less about what is the quarterly impact, but actually how do you think about the strategy of these businesses and generative of AI from a long haul perspective. And you know, when I think about all the green on the page and to your point, the valuation, you know, I think there's a lot of optimism. We've come off of a couple of very difficult years from a deal volume perspective. So you're seeing folks really rebound with with some excitement. At the same time, again, these trends will will take a good amount of time. Does that create then a premium on the actual valuation then when it comes to to tech? I mean, tech, again, I'm bringing this from an equity perspective, is already at extreme valuations. Is there a built-in premium to that story? And how does that affect perhaps the lack of buyout exits? You know, we are enterprise software investors from a private market standpoint solely. And so I can't really comment on some of the public market valuations and where we'll see them go. What I can tell you is that the enterprise software business model has been one of the most resilient and productive we've seen since the Industrial Revolution. We have seen it continue to be high from a contribution standpoint for profitability, growth, and durability despite economic cycles. And so when I think about the valuation environment on the private side, especially for the small cap market, which is the fund that that I run, it really is an opportunity for us to not be attached to those public market comps and instead think about the long-term durability of these businesses. And they really have have proven out over the last few years to be that resilient. You know, we have seen valuations come down about 50% since the height in kind of 2021 and early 2022. That said, they've normalized over the last 18 months in a way that I think has been very healthy and expected. So is that normalization, is that the same as resilience? And the way I say that is you put this in the context of the economic cycle. There is a question right now of this kind of unprecedented economic resilience we're seeing in the American economy, arguably the European economy as well. What does a red flag look like for you in terms of, hey, maybe there may be cracks emerging? Yeah. We only invest in mission-critical software companies, and so these are companies that are powering businesses in every sector around the globe. These are products that actually, when the pandemic hit, companies chose to pay their software renewal bills instead of paying rent. Yeah. And so I, I think you know when we think about the companies that have that durability, it are, they're the ones that have high ROI. They have the consistent value creation and R and delivery that they provide to those end customers. And they're the companies, again, that don't get turned off. And so I think that mission criticality for me is part of the safeguard that I that I would consider. I think, you know, in terms of some of the red flags, I would be looking at companies that are nice to have versus mission critical in these cycles where there's a lot of unknowns. Rachel, I would be remiss to not talk about one of the major deals that Vista Equity Partners has done. Pluralsight is in conversation, especially here in Super Return right now. We know it's been in the news a lot. Bloomberg has reported about how that story has been written down and, and for Vista Partners. There's a lot of confusion. Perhaps you can clarify for our audience here why the write-down actually existed, a $50 million payment. Why not just inject that liquidity directly into the company? Why do it the way it panned out? Unfortunately, I'm not able to comment in on, e- on any investment performance. And you know what I think, what I can say is that this is a business that has very specific company-based issues in light of a very difficult external macro environment. And so I would just encourage you not to overthink some of what's being said because I think it's a very fluid situation. 
Well, in that case, let's macro it a little yeah. bit. It feels like Pluralsight can even be at least bringing up some concerns about deal structure and what kind of covenants and kind of the nitty-gritty actually look like. There are questions around NAV financing. There are questions around synthetic payments and kinds. These are a lot of jargon for our international yeah. audience. Yeah. Do you feel like these deals are getting more and more complicated? How, how are you thinking about deal structure right now? It's interesting. So in the small cap space, which is where we invest, we really don't see as much of this heavy structuring taking place. We continue to see a focus on core fundamentals. We don't use a lot of leverage in the small cap space. And by small cap, I really mean companies with under 40 million in annual recurring revenue. And these are businesses that candidly we, we acknowledge can't necessarily bear the the weight of heavy interest rate expense. And so that hasn't been as much of an issue for us in the small cap space. Interesting. All right, a last question to you. It's ECB day. We're about a week away from uh, Fed Day as well. Talk to us a little bit about this interest rate environment. What kind of cushion does it create in the private capital markets when we're talking again about that keyword you used, resilience? You know, we don't bet on interest rates when we think about the deals that we structure and the deals that, that we bring to investment committee. And so, candidly, while we're interested to see how this plays out, it hasn't been as impactful on our deal volumes and our strategy currently. Yeah. Um, but because we have a private credit platform here at Vista, we're very bullish on the opportunity ahead, yeah. and we're proud of the results that the team's brought to bear. All right. Rachel Arnold, Senior Managing Director over at Vista Equity Partners. A pleasure to have you. Pleasure to see you in Berlin. Tom, back to you. Okay, Bloomberg Markets today, anchor Kriti Gupta with that exclusive interview. There's plenty more coming up. This is Bloomberg. It is once again the corporate story of the week. NVIDIA above $3 trillion in terms of market cap for the first time overtaking Apple but for size and scope let's put this in context if you combine Nvidia Apple and Microsoft and their market caps you are looking at a market cap combined of these three companies that is greater larger than the entire market cap of mainland China and by the way mainland China is not a minnow in fact it's the second largest market in the world because combined Microsoft Apple Nvidia you have more than nine trillion dollars of market cap you added just for Nvidia the stock is up 150 percent year to date it has added 1.8 trillion dollars in market cap just this year alone. And by the way, Jensen Huang, of course, the CEO of that company, added $5 billion to his personal wealth just yesterday. Let's flip the board because NVIDIA's fortunes are linked to ASML, which is now the second largest company in terms of market cap here in Europe, overtaking LVMH. The shares popped 8% yesterday. The shares are up about 40% year to date. This is the crucial company making the kit that churns out and enables you to churn out these semiconductors. There's plenty more on these stories and a deep dive of the ECB. Markets Today next. This is Bloomberg. <laughs> 